so much for sharing your story with us. She's in this service. We all stand and give her a hand. That takes a lot of grace and courage. And we have hundreds of other young women, just like Brittany, who are being ministered to through our, our abortion recovery small group ministry. Thank you for Dina and Angela who have put in the hours, the years to bring this ministry to fruition. And if you know anyone that is struggling, that needs help, there are two victims in every abortion, a mother and a child. And um, we have to take care of the ones that we have among us. And I'm grateful for a church who doesn't bury their head in the sand, but that who recognizes we live in a fallen world, and we don't always make um, the best choices, and, um, but God, there's redemption for that, and God has a great um, way of writing our story in such a beautiful way. Well, I want to share something, kind of a little bit of a big reveal today, uh, something we've been working on behind the scenes. Our team here uh, of creatives are just amazing, and they have taken time over the past few years to really do some marketing research about Covenant and our brand. And for the past probably 10 years, I think we've had this logo that's on the screen behind me right now. And as you heard Pastor Mike's, our founding pastor's message last week about covenant, I want to explain to you what this logo meant and has meant for us is the walk of covenant, that figure eight. So a lot of people that see this think it stands for just two C's or um, the infinity symbol we get a lot. Some people think it's the sign for recycling. And um, so we've had trouble explaining what it is because obviously if you don't hear the context of the walk of covenant, um, it, it can, it, it's an inner circle understanding, correct? And we want our church to be an open invitation that makes really clear that there is space and room for every person who's coming in. So our team has been working on our branding for some time, and we were established in 1976. We have heritage, we have history, we have a great, strong foundation. And they let me know that, you know, having a heritage is a cool thing again. I guess for a time we wanted to look like, you know, a startup church with bright colors and all that. And there's nothing wrong with that, but it isn't really who we are. We are foundationally a, a home church. And in this process, they told us, you know, there's psychology behind all of this, but but using a lowercase font is more approachable. So we are changing our logo type. You're going to see things that are going to be showing up for you on on social media and on our website, and we don't want you to miss Covenant Church because the icon is going to change. So I wanna show you our new brand mark and tell you what the symbolism is behind it so that you can even explain that to people when you talk about the church that you attend. So in this brand mark, we have that iconic picture that really shows the, the symbolism of our founding building. So you do see the shapes of the windows for our Covenant campus here in Carrollton, but that's not the reason we chose this. The reason we chose this really has to do with the idea of all of us coming together at the highest point. So the arch represents that for us. Even though we may come in, you see the base of the logo, there is separation between, almost like pillars. But all of those things come together at the top, at the highest point. And that's what we believe, that we may not be on the same side of the aisle, we may not be on the same side of social situations or, or opinions or narratives, but when we come together, we join together at the highest point. And the highest point is what matters, amen? Because all the other things will pass away. The center of this logo is an open window and it represents the authenticity and transparency of the core value of this church. And then the crosses you see on the sides, on the sides they um, obviously are interpreted as what we know the cross means to be, but they, they bring two things together. And so a cross represents many things, redemption, victory, um, and it represents faith through salvation in Jesus. Also, the arched window is inspired by the architecture, but it leaves an open space in the center, and I love that because it's saying there's room for you. 
There's an open place for you, and we're not complete without you joining. So what we heard from people in the branding and marketing uh, questionnaire of the church is what three words really represent covenant to you. And the first word people said was heritage or covenant foundation. The second word, and you heard this in Brittany's testimony as well, is the word home. So many people said, when I came in, I just felt at home. So the reason we chose the shape in the center is not to represent a church without a steeple. That's actually the shape of a home. And so what we see is the foundation of the church intersecting with the home and the values at home. So not only is your church your home, but you take church home with you because we are the church. Amen? So we've got new colors coming with this branding. You're going to see them all rolled out in the next two weeks. And we've got um, systematic things that will be replaced, our signage, the web pages, the skins, our, our app. It will all look different because that bright blue is going away. It's going to be replaced with our heritage blue and Oxford blue and the greens, the earthen greens that we have and alabaster. So you're going to see that. And you're also going to get brand new Dream Team shirts next week. So that's exciting. You're going to love them. And um, on the back of our Dream Team shirts, it will say, we are the church, which I love because it's not about a building. It's about us coming together as individuals. We are the church, but we gather together in a place we call home, Covenant Church. So today when you leave, you're going to get stickers, a little page of stickers that you can use. These are not for your car, but this one is. You can put on your car, and I'm going to tell you right now, if you are not a good driver, do not put this on your car. <laughs> Somebody needs to go, you know, get some from another church and stick them on your car if you're a bad driver. When I was a kid, uh, we, my, my father's assistant picked me up from school, and we were, we were driving down uh, Josie Lane, and this man had his car covered in Honk If You Love Jesus stickers, and so we caught up with him and honked and waved, and we went to catch our eyes with his. He was flipping us off. <laughs> I'm like, uh, he must have a borrowed vehicle or something. He cannot figure out why all these people are honking at him, and he's really upset about it. I, I don't think he put those stickers there, but it, don't put this on your car if you're not a good witness, okay? Uh, please. Thank you. All right, y'all ready to jump into the Word of God today? God's got a great message for us, and I believe so strongly in, in the passion that I feel. Last night it was hard for me to go to sleep because I just feel like a fire shut up in my bones for all the things that I know God wants to say to his children and his people. And this is a season of God bringing us into greater alignment and, uh, and authority. You know, we don't have authority without alignment. If you saw someone in the military, you wouldn't just run up to them and say, I want one of those guns. I'd like a uniform like that. And they don't have the permission to give it to you. Why? Because you have to go to a higher authority. There's a process you go through. There's an alignment. There's some papers you need to sign. There's some time in your life you lay down in exchange for the authority of carrying a weapon and wearing a uniform. So for you and I to come into alignment first with God is the greatest relationship that will make or break your life. And in this series about makers and breakers, I want to recap Pastor Mike's message last week on covenant. He gave us the eight steps of covenant where we have to say things and we do things and covenant relationships are rare. They're not every relationship in your life. Um, covenant relationships are the relationships you build your life with. So I'm going to take that message just a step further today and talk about the importance of your alignment and what that has on your assignment. You know, all of us are on the planet today and many of us are saying to ourselves, why am I here? What am I here for? What has God called me to do? What did he create me to do? And the greatest way to find that out is by coming into alignment with him, knowing him. He's your creator. You're not your own maker. He's our maker. And when we come into alignment with the one who made us, 
Then we get the owner's manual. And once we have the owner's manual, we know how to be good stewards of the gifts he's put in us. He hides things from us until we come into alignment with him. And then when we're in alignment with him, all the gift anointing, these pockets of revelation are revealed to us. And they were there the whole time, but he hid those things from us because if we're out of alignment with him, we would do harm instead of good. So our greatest alignment is first with God and second with others. There's a lot of people who are only interested in the assignment God has for them and not the alignments God has for them. And there is no purpose for assignment without alignment. I'm going to say that again for the people in the back. No purpose for your assignment without alignment. Why? Because our assignment cannot exist outside of the context of relationship. God's purposes are always connected to his people. There's no purpose without people. I know we would love to think that our dream is just going to be fulfilled and we could walk in all greatness and authority and never have to speak to anybody who might be against us or maybe difficult. That will never happen. I told you, if it was in my iniquity, to just stay in a cave and write books and never deal with people, I would have stayed there. I have very close friends like my friend Mira. She knows we sat in the park many times and I just told her I have difficulty stepping out of my comfort zone. I just, I'm good with just a book. All my books are my best friends. But I recognize that the whole, there's no revelation. I'm called to bring revelation. I'm called to shed light. I'm called to be a chef in the kitchen and bring you good meals. And I can't do that if, if there are no people to bring it to. I have no purpose. God's not going to keep giving me revelation if I don't have an outlet. Right? I've got to be connected to my assignment. And, and, and it's all about people. Assignment and alignment go together. There is not one without the other. So you want to know what you're called to do, what your assignment is. You start with getting in alignment with God. We're going to talk about how to do that in a minute. And with others. It's important. So what's alignment? Well, to be an ally means that you align yourself with someone or something in two ways. With your words and with your actions. An alliance requires both. You don't just say you're for someone, you show up for them. And it wouldn't be an alliance if you just say you are for them and you don't show up. Or the opposite, you could show up for them and your presence be there, but you speak against them when you're there. It takes both word and action. The Bible calls this two-part promise a vow. You and I, in modern urban vernacular, we don't use the word vow very often unless we're talking about a wedding. But you make vows. You make commitments to things that are important to you. You make a promise. There's a contract when you buy a vehicle or you buy a house. You sign that I will do what I say I'm going to do. And someone holds you to account for that. Well, the Bible says that vows are really important to God. We hear about it a lot when he's setting up his government with the children of Israel in the wilderness in the books of Exodus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. He talks a lot about vows and how important it is to do what you say. In fact, in the book of Numbers, he says this, if a man vows a vow to the Lord, that's his vertical alignment, or swears an oath to bind himself by a pledge, that's his horizontal alignment. He shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. Amen? And this is not just an Old Testament value that God has. We may not value vows anymore, but God didn't change valuing vows. He still values vows. And in the New Testament, if somebody wants to preach that it's just Old Testament, let's give them a little context for how God feels about vows in the New Testament. There was a married couple and they were coming to church. They had a piece, a parcel of land that they wanted to sell and bring the proceeds to church. And, and the apostle Peter was there that morning collecting the offering. And this couple named Ananias and Sapphira, they walk in 
to bring their offering. And when they bring it, because it's a large sum, they say, this is all the amount we made from the property we sold. Peter, with a word of knowledge, looks at them and he says, Ananias, but this isn't the complete amount. God would have been happy with the amount you brought if you hadn't have promised the full amount. But you want spiritual credit for what you sold when you didn't bring everything. So your words and your actions are incongruent. And because they're incongruent, there is accountability. There is judgment. And right in that moment, the Bible says that Ananias falls to the floor dead, doesn't breathe another breath. His wife, Sapphira, who's standing there, she didn't make or break the vow, but she was a witness to the vow. And Peter said, because you witnessed to the lie and you did not correct him or hold him accountable, your punishment will be swift. And hers was she fell dead as well. A couple years ago, we had a, um, some people in the church that named their kids Ananias and Sapphira. And I said, that's when you know just a, enough Bible to get you in trouble. I think you need to study, you know, the story behind the name. It sounds pretty. But the legacy attached to that name is a very strong one. You know, I know that the word accountability is not popular in this day. No one wants to be accountable, especially this generation. But we better, as disciples of Christ, begin to practice accountability because there is a day we will be held to account for every word we've spoken, for every deed we've done, for every relationship we've broken. We will be held account. We will be held account to the gifts that we have not um, buried. We buried instead of producing for the kingdom. We will be held account. So we better practice accountability. By doing what we say we're going to do. My husband, from the very beginning, I remember years ago, way before cell phones, I would go to Walmart and I'd say, I'm just going to run to Walmart. We had four kids under the age of three. So when I went to Walmart, I got lost. And I didn't have a cell phone. And I remember I'd come back three hours later and he's like, what in the world? You left me with these kids for all this time. Where have you been? I'm like, Walmart. He's like... No one can spend three hours in Walmart. I'm like, yes, they can. <laughs> Maybe not a man, less Bass Pro, you could spend three hours in there. But I remember him saying to me, Amy, do what you say you're going to do. I, you can have more time, but be home when you tell me you're going to be home. I remember having to submit to that accountability because I wanted to do spontaneous things. But I recognized I need to do what I say I'm going to do. And it's been valuable to have a husband who holds me accountable to that. Amen. So vows are important to God. He hears the vows. He listens in on the vows we make one to another. So I want to take you to the book of Judges this morning. If you have your Bible, you can open it with us to Judges 13, or you can follow along on the screen. But this covers the story of a man named Samson. Most people, even outside the church, have heard something about a man named Samson, this man who had uncommon strength. He, he did uncommon things. He once killed a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey. He killed lions with his bare hands. He was uncommon in his strength. But where his strength came from, the secret source of his strength, was actually based on a vow. And I want to take you to that story of Samson and his beginning in Judges 13, 1 through 5. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. So the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. A certain man of Zorah named Manoah from the clan of Danites had a wife who was childless, unable to give birth. The angel of the Lord appeared to her and said, You are barren and childless, but you are going to become pregnant and give birth to a son. Now see to it that you drink no wine or other fermented drink and that you do not eat anything unclean. You will become pregnant and have a son whose head is never to be touched by a razor because the boy is to be a Nazarite, dedicated to God from the womb. He will take the lead in delivering Israel from the hands of the Philistines. And this is when Samson was marked to be a judge of Israel. 
Now, the judges of Israel ruled in a time before the kings of Israel came. So it was after the prophets, and during a time, some of the judges were also prophets, like Deborah. But Samson was called to judge, and whenever God would raise up a judge, he would raise up a judge in Israel to either judge his people internally or to judge the enemies externally that were, were holding them captive, or sometimes both. So that was the purpose of a judge. So this vow that his mother made to the angel of God, the Nazarite vow, includes that you cannot drink alcohol, either beer or wine. Yes, beer was in the Bible. No dead bodies can you touch. So it's inconvenient when it's time to be at a funeral. You can't be the pallbearer, but you're the strongest guy in the room. And no haircut. Let's look at the things that were part of his vow. Sometimes a vow is, I will do something. But this vow constituted of restraint. These are the things I will not do. And these things audited his actions at both high times of celebration, no wine, no beer, no alcohol, and also low times, no funerals. So you can't participate in the things that bring your people together culturally, the times of celebration and the times of sadness. Samson, you're out of the picture. And do not cut your hair. Well, this is what's interesting is Samson did not make this vow. His mother made the vow, but he kept the vow. Once he was aware of it and he was, he was raised up, he was aware this is where the source of his strength came from, he protected it. And it's interesting to note, God never told him the source of your strength needs to be a secret. He didn't, but Samson knew enough about the enemies of Israel to know, I better keep it a secret where this strength comes from. It's an internal vow that I've made that I also take action on to protect my gift and anointing for this assignment. So the Nazarite vow was what his vow was that he lived under. But there are many vows throughout scripture where action was required to back up a promise that was spoken. Let's look at Abram. When Abram, before he's Abraham, is called into covenant with God, God makes a promise over his life. And he says, I know you don't have any children right now, and that's the place of your greatest pain and struggle, but I'm gonna make you the father of many nations. But before I can make you a father, I need to make you a son. You must come out from your father's house. Because your gift and anointing will not be protected in that environment. I'm going to provide for you and protect you as, as God, but you will be my son first before I make you a father. So let's look at the action required. Abram wanted to receive the promise from God, but in order to receive it, he had to step out of his comfort zone, out of the familiar. And God didn't even give him an address or GPS and say, put this in your phone, this is where you're gonna meet me. God said, just come with me, step out first, and then I will show you what I'm gonna give you. A break had to happen. For God to make him, he first had to break him. I don't want your father speaking into what I'm doing. I don't want there to be a conflict of, of what master you're serving. Abram, come out of your father's house. And then Abram goes and multiplies. He brought his nephew Lot with him because he didn't have a child. And he looked at Lot as a successor. And God said to him one day, you need to separate from Lot. Lot has his own lot in life. He's not a part of this promise, so you need to separate from him. That's another difficult move that Abram had to make in order to fulfill the vow that God had given him. There were contractually obligations. Obey the word of the Lord. So Abram did this. He separated twice in order for God to multiply him. I find this really interesting that a lot of times when God is speaking multiplication and elevation over our lives, what we first feel is division. Before multiplication, we feel division. We feel that we have to be set apart. Something's pulled out. Something's rejected. And we feel that. And I want you to see that other people in the word of God had to make these moves through faith. We read the Bible and we see the end of the story for them. We see the fulfillment. We don't see those days of pain. We don't see the in the meantime. 
there was a lot of in the meantime in the Bible. Let's look at Moses. Moses chose the Hebrew cause over his family, his adopted family, which was Pharaoh's family. So he had to leave the palace. He went into the wilderness in discomfort. Nobody was cooking for him. Nobody was massaging oil on his feet. Nobody was clothing him. He had to do it all. He had to step away from comfort into discomfort before God could make him into the great leader. Rahab, we know, is a woman who made a vow, and this story is really beautiful. She's a woman who lived, the Bible said that she was an innkeeper, it's translated prostitute, we don't know. Uh, I'll, we'll apologize to her when we get to heaven for the English translation if she was just a, ran a Motel 6 or something, you know. <laughs> She, she had an inn, though. And so when the spies came in to spy out Jericho, they go in and stay with her. And when, she's, when her house is being searched, she hides them under the harvest on her roof. And she says to them, I will not tell anybody that I've hidden you because I believe your God is who he says he is. I put my lot with you. I want to be a part of the children of Israel. So they said, well, if, if you do what you say you will do, and you don't tell that we were here so that the attack is a secret, then when the day of the attack comes and the Israelites show up, I want you to lower the scarlet cord out your window, the one we've climbed down to get free. Lower that and we will know you've kept your word and we will keep our word to spare you in that day of judgment. You know what I find really interesting about this? I've watched a documentary on it recently about the archaeological dig surrounding Jericho. And it's really phenomenal because they've discovered everything that said it happened biblically happened. In fact, there's a whole layer of ash because they burned everything, remember? What they found when they dug up the tell that was on top of uh, the archaeology of the, the biblical Jericho they found that there was a whole corner portion of the wall of Jericho that was left standing. Now, God heard the vows that passed between Rahab and the spies because God brought down the walls. That was a surprise to both of them. The spies couldn't have kept their promise if they wanted to. God backed up the vow that passed between them with his might and with his power. Rahab, she used the words of her mouth to put herself in alignment with God's people and she took action to back that up. And I want to just compare that for a moment. She's an outsider, possibly a prostitute, and yet God allows the words of her mouth and the action to back it up, to bring her into the lineage of Jesus. And yet we see a man who is a leader in the Levite tribe. His name is Korah. He raises up in a group of dissension against Moses. And when he speaks against Moses, God listens in and he says, does he think that he's murmuring against you, Moses? Because what I hear is him murmuring against me. And the words that he shared and spread, the words Korah shared, put him in information against the children of Israel. So I want you to remember this. The information that comes out of your mouth is the formation you are in. The information puts you in formation. Got it? Can you remember that? And, and you think the words don't matter. You think as soon as the sound is gone, they fall to the ground. They're not recorded. No, words intersect. They are the cross between the spirit realm and the physical realm. And when we speak words, every word we speak is a seed. It carries something. There is no neutral in the spirit. This is why when you plant a seed of, dis of destruction, you, we build, we make or break with our tongues, right? And when you plant a word, 
of deception or destruction or untruth. It is, it is your responsibility to go and uproot that lie. You don't just hope it'll go away and you don't pray for crop failure. You go pull it up and you do that by repenting, saying, honey, to your child, I'm sorry I disciplined you out of anger and I said those words. Please forgive me. We have to use our tongue to build or destroy and every single word is doing one or the other. Every word. There is no wasted word. It's how we connect the spirit with the physical. We're going to talk about words in the month. Uh, we're, we're doing a, a series on spiritual warfare in March, and I'm so excited about this because we're going to talk about what warfare really looks like, and we'll get into more about the words. But our tongue is listened to by God, and we will be held accountable for what we promise. The Bible said it's better to not promise anything and not do it. What you promise, you need to fulfill. Okay, so let's look at the stepping away. The common thread between all of these people is that they had to make a move to back up obediently the assignment on their life. Nehemiah had to do the same. He was a man who was a cupbearer to the king. He served in a Persian kingdom even though he was a Hebrew son, they were in exile. They didn't have a country anymore. And he starts grieving and the king says, you're sad. What's going on? And Nehemiah said, you know, I, I feel a burden for Jerusalem. The walls have been broken down. And the king sends him with letters of permission for his assignment to rebuild the walls. His alignment produced resources for his assignment. But he had to leave the palace. He had to leave a comfortable place. He had to camp out a lot of nights. He had to fight a lot of enemies. But there was a stepping away. There was even a stepping away with Jesus. I want you to see this, is that he was raised for 33 years in the house of his mother and father, stepfather Joseph. He had brothers and sisters. I don't believe they treated him like God every day. He had to work for his supper there was familiarity. We know later that when he tried to do miracles and work miracles in Nazareth, he said a prophet is without honor in his own hometown. Because when there's familiarity, when people are like, I saw you when you used to wear pull-ups. I don't have much respect for you know, God being your father. So Jesus separated from his family and his friends. When he was being called into ministry, he was first called into the wilderness. He was called out of his home. He left his home and his family and his friends behind him for 40 days. He was tempted by the enemy and he was trained by God. You know what he did coming out of that season of separation? He goes straight to Galilee and he sees a fisherman who's successful and he calls Peter and he says, come follow me. Peter leaves his business behind, his wife, his children, and he separates himself for three years to follow Jesus. The common thread here is, is that all of these people put alignment with God first before any other relationship. And every other relationship fell in line behind that one. Now, I know that when I'm saying these kind of things to you, you can say, that just doesn't sound very Christian-like to separate yourself from people. Aren't we supposed to be evangelists? I want to say this to you. I, I, I got tickled this week listening to people uh, argue online about whether uh, Jesus Christ was a Christian. Um, I was like, well, no, he wasn't a Christian because Christian means follower of Christ. So he was Christ. He wasn't a Christian. But it may sound like it's not very Christ-like for me to say that you need to separate from those people that are intimately connected to you that are not aligning with your assignment. Because it's hard to say it's not Christ-like when it's exactly what Christ did. He separated himself from his family and friends. He came out of the wilderness knowing full well what his assignment was. And he found relationships that would protect and ensure that he would complete his assignment. And did you know that one day he's praying for people, healing the sick, and he's preaching in the synagogue, 
and people were saying, he's lost his mind. And the word got back to his mother and his brothers. And the disciples came into the synagogue and said to Jesus, your mother and brothers are outside. They want to talk to you. And Jesus replies and says, these are my mother, brothers, and sisters. Those who are following my word and my way. This is who I'm aligned with. He broke the bloodline because when the bloodline did not help him complete his mission, he said, I've got to align myself with people who will protect what I'm called to do. Mary and, her, and the brothers wanted to take him home because people were saying he'd lost his mind. They didn't see what was on him. And you know, when Jesus was healing the sick, there were miracles by the hundreds happening in this one village. The Bible says he woke up early one morning and he left the village and went out to separate himself, to be alone. Peter came out and found him and he said, what's going on? People are waiting for you. They're waiting at the door for you to pray for them that they'll be healed. And Jesus said, I didn't come for miracles. I didn't come for healings. I came to preach the kingdom and the gospel. That is my purpose. And Peter said, all right, if that's your purpose and getting long lines like Benny Hinn is going to distract from your purpose, then we're moving on to the next village where people will hear the word. Because Jesus said to them, miracles, signs, and wonders will follow those who believe. But they first have to hear the kingdom. I'm not a show pony. I'm not here to do tricks for everybody. I'm here to preach. I'm here to plant seeds. And I got to plant the word of life. And then miracle signs and wonders are going to follow that. But Peter, hearing Jesus say, that, that's not my purpose, Peter. I don't need you to be an armor bearer and hold people's coats. I need you to help me get in a room with open ears and open hearts. I need to preach. And Peter said, okay, then we're going. I'm going to protect the assignment on your life. The people around him kept him in the seat of his assignment. So the common thread between all the people I just shared with you, and there are many, many more, is that every time alignment and assignment came together, there was a move that was required. I have to make a move toward what God is saying. Alignment can make or break your assignment. Your alignments will make or break your assignment. Let's catch up with Samson and see how it worked out for him. Samson in Judges 16, 4 through 6, it says, Sometime later, Samson fell in love with a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. Pastor James told me between services that the name Samson means light. Delilah means dark. He, the light fell in love with the dark. The rulers of the Philistines went to her and said, see if you can lure him into showing you the secret of his great strength and how we can overpower him so we may tie him up and subdue him. Each one of us will give you 1,100 shekels of silver. So Delilah said to Samson, tell me the secret of your great strength and how you can be tied up and subdued. So he told her everything. No razor has ever been used on my head, he said, because I've been a Nazarite dedicated to God from my mother's womb. If my head were shaved, my strength would leave me, and I would become as weak as any other man. Verse 18, when Delilah saw that he had told her everything, she sent word to the rulers of the Philistines, come back once more. He's told me everything. So the rulers of the Philistines returned with the silver in their hands. And after putting him to sleep on her lap, she called for someone to shave off the seven braids of hair. And so began to subdue him. And his strength left him. Then she called, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He awoke from his sleep and thought, I'll go out as before and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. Then the Philistines seized him, gouged out his eyes, and took him down to Gaza. Binding him with bronze shackles, they set him to grinding grain in the prison. Now let's look at this scenario right now about this vow. 
We know that Samson didn't even make the vow. His mother made it, right? But he kept it. He didn't break the vow either. He didn't cut his own hair. Samson surrounded himself with and made himself vulnerable to his enemy. That's what he was guilty of. Samson surrounded himself to wrong relationships. And this, if you don't hear anything else today, you got to hear this. What we allow close to us can open a door in our lives that weakens us, that blinds us, and ultimately breaks us and separates us from the purpose of God on our lives. There's a connection between our alignment and our assignment, a connection that makes us or a connection that breaks us. Because Samson didn't cut his own hair. He didn't weaken himself or gouge out his own eyes and take his own vision and put himself in bondage. He didn't do those things. But all of that happened to him because of who he spent time with. Because of who he spent time with. Samson didn't understand the assignment. He fell in love with his enemy. He lowered his guard and he lost his power and authority. We are responsible to surround ourselves with those who will help us keep our vows to God. We cannot hope to fulfill our God-given purpose if we're sleeping with the enemy. Our alignments will make or break the assignment on our life. Somebody hear me this morning. The people that you are connected to right now in close proximity, if they are not protecting the anointing on your life, if they are not spurring you on to good works, if they are not encouraging you in the faith, they are not alignments for your assignment. They're not. And it's... It's your job to remove yourself from a situation. If you have put your anointing at risk, if you have put your vision at risk by who you're talking to all the time, I'm not talking about not reaching the lost. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about who you're sleeping with, who you're talking to every day. Those close relationships have the power to make or break you. Not just random people that you're ministering to. You shouldn't be using your inner circle, your inner sanctum, your bed to evangelize. When the enemy comes knocking on your door and says, you you can't cut me off. That's not Christian-like. You need to say, Jesus looked at a whole room full of foreigners and said, these are my people. Not my mother, not my brother, not my sister outside because they don't understand or acknowledge the assignment on my life. These people do, so they're my people. They're my family. It's important for us to be able to get this because the enemy will come to you and say, especially if you're full of empathy and compassion, and he'll say, you got to bring in every stray dog into your house, and, and, and that will give you purpose and significance. And we want to minister, but we minister out of the overflow. We can't keep laying our head on the lap of our enemy and expecting to overcome. He's overcoming you. A lady this week got upset with me because I posted something online about raising our children in church. And She didn't like that, and she said, you know, I'll I'll remind my children they're the church. They don't have to go to the church. And she said, I'm not church hurt. I was raised in church, but I'm not church hurt. I just don't feel like there's, I feel like it's futile. I don't feel like there's anything. It doesn't do any good. And I said, um, gracefully, I responded. I didn't tell her what I'd like to tell you right now. And that is the same thing that, you know, I, I can say we are the church. We're putting that on the back of our Dream Team shirts. Of course you are the church. It's not a building. But that's the same way I could say I'm married. But if I stop going home, I won't be married very long. In order to stay the church, we have to stay connected to the body of Christ. You can't say I'm part of the body of Christ, but I'm totally disconnected. No, then you're not part of the body of Christ. And there is nothing, hear me right now, 
There is nothing right now in our generation more anti-Christ than the anti-church rhetoric that's going on right now. That is anti-body of Christ. And if it's anti-body of Christ, you're slapping the Savior in the face because he came to produce a bride in the earth, a bride without spot or wrinkle. Do we make mistakes? Absolutely. We're not perfect. We're people. You're never going to find a perfect church because the minute you show up, it's not perfect anymore. <laughs> Amen? That's what, if I'm going to go hunt for a, a perfect church, I'm going to have to stay home and watch them online. Church is not called to be perfected by us. It's perfected by him. But if we don't ever spend time together, we can't figure out, am I the hand? Am I the feet? Am I the eyes? Am I the ears? What part of the body am I? How can I serve? And I want us to get to a place, oh, my heart burns for this, where we don't just think about what can the church do for me, but we think, where can I use my gifts? I need to show up for church because I have something inside me. I got to give out. I got to minister. I got to have an outlet. I got to use these words that God's given me. It isn't just about showing up to receive and how posh and how fun and how exciting it is. It's about using your anointing. What is the assignment on your life? And unfortunately, I could tell you hundreds, if not thousands. My memory, I couldn't do thousands. My memory isn't what it used to be. But I know hundreds of stories where alignment to the body of Christ in Renew, in freedom groups, in small groups, in youth ministry, was the alignment that brought the assignment, that brought wholeness on people's lives. I wanna share with you just my own story. Last week, they showed you some really embarrassing footage of me um, with blonde hair. I won't call out my cousin who tried to highlight it for me. And you remember when they had those caps that you would pull highlighting through? My cousin Andrea, we decided she was gonna highlight my hair for me because my hair was blonde as a child and it was starting to darken. So I had an ombre look going on. So we were trying to blend it. So we put one of those caps on my head. And uh, when we pulled it off, we realized that she had pulled all the hair from the back of my head through the front. So the whole front was dark and the whole back was bleached. It was, I was quite a sight. And you got to see that last Sunday. I'd never seen that footage, but I knew immediately what it was when I saw the t-shirt I had on. I was wearing a shirt that said guts because that's what it takes to stand up for Jesus. And that was a, a summer ensemble trip where I spent the early part of my life singing, not speaking. I sang in high school. I went to Newman Smith. Um, if you go to that school, you can probably still see my picture on the wall in the choir room. It's one of my friends um, from high school right there. Um, and I, I sang. I loved it. I you don't get opportunities to speak when you're a child, obviously, and I didn't know that's what I was called to do. But when I look back now at that, I was 16 in that video, and I was crying. I remember that summer and how pivotal that alignment that summer was for where I am right now. Because see, some of my close friends who had boyfriends, two girls I think of in particular, they chose not to go on that that summer camp trip and that evangelistic tour that came out of it because they had a boyfriend. They thought, next year I'll do it when I don't have a boyfriend, but I don't wanna go without him. So they made a very strategic decision based on a very temporary relationship, but it had eternal consequences because I remember after that, they were never really a part of what God was doing. I encourage you parents so much, make your kids go to camp. You want them to be prepared, you make them go to school. You make them show up in an environment where the whole world feels like it's against them. Send them to an environment where everybody is for them. <laughs> Baptize them in that, that love and acceptance. It's life changing. And for me, I think about the alignments that my parents put around me. Some of the couples were on stage last Sunday that you got to see. They were people that my parents put in my life. My youth pastor, Pastor Ricky, I would listen to him when I wouldn't listen to my parents. They surrounded me with alignments 
that saw the assignment on my life. That's why the body of Christ is so powerful. I'm all for ministering online. We have people watching all over the nation and all over the world, and it's a bigger campus for us than any one of our buildings. But if you have the ability to gather with a church of believers, there's nothing more transformational for the next generation. Your kids need that. They need relationships. Our online campus, they can send their kids to camp. I encourage you to think about the alignments in your life. Who do you spend most time with? I remember Zig Ziglar saying, show me your five closest friends and I'll show you who you are. Who's pouring into you? Who are you connected to? Because unfortunately, I've seen throughout the years so many testimonies of alignment making people. I've seen a lot of alignments breaking people. I've seen young people saying, I'm called to the ministry, or I'm called to do that, or I'm passionate about worship. And then years later, because they marry somebody who's okay with it, in the beginning, they're like, I don't have any problem with you doing it. It's not my thing. Then a couple years later, it, they've talked them into, it's all a joke. There's no fruit because they didn't protect the assignment. It is our responsibility to put ourselves in connection and covenant relationship with people who can make us, not break us. And I wanna give you something. This is the free part right here. But I wanna give you just this little nugget right here. Is the relationships that make you don't always make you comfortable. In fact, the ones that make you really comfortable are usually the ones that break you. Think about Delilah putting him to sleep on her lap, destruction in her heart. Stay here, Samson. Don't make anything out of your life. But you know, the Bible says in Judges that the hair on his head began to grow again after it was shaved and Samson's strength returned. And you know, the key to that returning was he got out of Delilah's presence. He got alone again. He heard the voice of God again. Was he still in chains? Yeah. But his mind wasn't. He got his mind right. And when he got his mind right, everything else fell into place. His assignment was still there. And this is what I want you to see is that we serve a God who makes and we serve a God who breaks. And this morning, I feel like the Holy Spirit wants to break every chain that has bound you into alignments that you made years before and you are still struggling with being aligned to addiction, being aligned to apathy, being aligned to um, laziness, being aligned to relationships that take you down and not up. God is going, I want to break this. I want to break the chains. And he's able. But it's important for us to move in our mind and our heart and our spirit to a place where we see alignment is pivotal to our assignment. There is not one without the other. And you're not going to figure out what God's called you to do in a vacuum. It's going to take relationships. And you know what I'm so excited about today is I know that this is the tripwire. This kind of word right now says the people of God are ready to go to the next level because every next level comes as a result of a new relationship. It does. God brings a new person into your life or he renews the relationships and alignments that you have. He makes them fresh and new again. God can do that. Do you believe that? I want you to stand with me here and at every campus. I feel like there are people under the sound of my voice that are saying, how can I get back on track? I feel like I've lost so many years out of alignment. It doesn't matter, your assignment has not changed. It's still there. You simply need to step out of the environment that has made you sick. You can't get well in the same place that made you sick. It's time to step out of toxic relationships. It's time to draw a line in the sand. There needs to be a boundary. 
I was talking to somebody yesterday at the well and one of our leaders and she said, you know, I had to draw a line in the sand with someone close to my family. And I said, if you go back on that subject again, I'm just warning you, I'm gonna say, I gotta go, bye. And she said, they put me to the test. And they begin to start ranting about this person I told them they couldn't talk about. And she said, I said, I gotta go by and hung up. She said, it only took one time drawing that line and they called me back and said, I got it. I'll never do that again. You, it, it's your responsibility. You do understand that? It's your responsibility. Samson didn't make the vow and he didn't break the vow, but it was his job to keep it. It's your job to keep the assignment that God's given you. It's your job to protect the anointing. And I believe there are computers that need firewalls put on them. There's cell phones that need to delete some apps today. There's some news you need to stop watching. You need to be discerning. And that's what I wanna pray over you in the next few moments is that the, the Holy Spirit gives you the power to discern so that then when you wake up in the morning and you go, okay, today, I don't wanna lose my strength. This strength that I have, God show me every environment I step into that weakens me. I wanna be aware of what this environment is. Cause I'm gonna set a boundary. I'm gonna set myself apart. I'm gonna step out of that place. And then when God does that, you gotta hold yourself accountable. So maybe you wake up in the morning and you turn on the news and you can't remember your bad day started with that argument on TV. Maybe it's the feed that you're looking at online. Maybe it's the close relationships that need boundaries. There's too, familiar, too much familiarity. Let me tell you this. If you draw a line, you're going to be doing them as big of a favor as you're doing yourself. Because the Bible says we're not defiled by what comes in, but what goes out of our mouth. And I've had to have hard conversations with people I love more than anything and say, listen, when you open your mouth and only negative things comes out, you don't understand what it does to my body, what it does to the environment. It's not healthy for me. So if you're going to do that, I'm going to have to step out of the room. I love you, but I can't stay here and listen to that. I want to live. I want to have more birthdays. But when the Lord gave me the discernment, I began to pray. I said, God, what are the environments that are making me sick? Show me what it is. And I began to see every place that the enemy would open the door. And it was just because I wanted to feel like everybody else. Pastor James, I'm not going to preach your sermon, but... He, he was telling me what he loved about Samson so much is that it said he was a man of uncommon strength. And Samson said, if you cut my hair, I'll be like any other man, I'll be common. And what's really sad about us is that the world has talked us into the idea that we should want to be common. We should want to fit in. Why do you wanna be spectacular? Why do you want to be extraordinary? Why do you want to operate in the gifts that God's given you? You're going to stand out. Can you imagine all the talk that went against the people I read to you earlier? Abraham, Peter, Rahab, all their family members. I can imagine Peter's family members saying, that's a terrible business idea. You're going to abandon your business after you've built it up to this place to follow this hoodlum wandering all over, this nomad? Think about the, the talk that would have gone that's not written about in the Bible. Think about Abraham's father saying, you could inherit all of these things, but yet you're going to leave. Those same enemies, those same demonic spirits are assigned to you that were assigned to these people. They've been lying a long time and they're really good at it. They're really good at getting in your ear and saying, who do you think you are? And they will use scripture to tell you to back down, to play small, to be shrink back. You know, I know I'm going over, but it's a big meal. I'm a finish. I so appreciate you showing up too. What, how beautiful is this after COVID to see the house packed? <laughs> when God spoke to me and told me that I was um, an arrow, I remember him saying, Amy, you're a weapon in my hand and your only prayer to me should be aim me which is the phonetic sound of my name 
because what I wanted was to know what the assignment was and all the twists and turns and corners and doors. And I wanted the whole address before I said yes. And God said, Amy, you're an arrow. And he showed me a picture of an arrow flying through the air and me as that arrow changing my mind when I saw the, the bullseye and going, I don't wanna go there. I'm gonna come back here. And it's humorous because we know arrows can't do that unless they're mi missile guided systems that Pastor Sid used to design for airplanes. But rudimentary arrows cannot change their direction. And the Holy Spirit said, Amy, I'm taking care of the path. I, I've got the doors ready for you. All I need you to do is stay faithful. And the only prayer you need to pray about your assignment is God, aim me. I'll say yes, aim me. God wants to speak very clearly to you about the assignment on your life. It's gonna take movement though. It's gonna take you stepping out of the comfortable, out of the familiar and saying, God, I believe there's a call on my life. And I gotta activate that. Remember, it's not just words, it's actions. So what I wanna do here right now is I wanna take a moment to just turn this whole place into an altar. If you'll close your eyes with me right now. Man, the spirit of the Lord is so heavy in this place. I feel his pleasure over you. The cry of your heart right now is that God would show you how you got off track. So in some way you could try to rehearse or fix the past. And what the Spirit of the Lord is saying right now is, it is not your job to know what you did, what you did wrong. We're not gonna do a post-mortem on all your decisions. All you need to do right now is say that you believe that I am who I say I am and that I have marked you for a purpose and you believe that there is nothing you could do to remove that from your life. But there is everything you can do right now to step back into alignment and obey my word. And I'm gonna ask right now as I pray that the Holy Spirit and the voice of many waters is gonna speak to every person under the sound of my voice right now. It's his voice, it's his word that's taking over right now. He's gonna speak to you exactly what moves you need to make to come back into alignment with him. And as we pray this prayer, I'm gonna ask that you just repeat this after me before I turn it back to the campus pastors. Dear God, my life is not my own. I wanna come completely, wholly into alignment with your plan for my life. Father, forgive me for stepping out on my own, for rejecting your purpose. God, I ask right now that you give me discernment in every relationship. God, that you show me what steps I need to take to separate myself, to protect the anointing and the assignment on my life. And God, I commit to you that every person that is to be aligned with me, I will empower, I will pray over, I will bless with words of life, and not words of death. And I thank you for the privilege and the honor to be in alignment and unity with you, Heavenly Father. So it is written, so it is done. Amen and amen. Let's give the Lord a shout. God is not just your maker, he's the breaker of chains. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me during worship for this auditorium right now, that if there's a chain that you need broken in your life right now, I see chains of addiction. God wants to speak over that right now and break it. Healing is gonna come to you because you step out. I'm gonna turn this altar, it's gonna be open right now to anyone who wants to come down for healing. Prayer of healing right now. Healing is gonna come because you step out. Make a move to say, I believe God that you are who you say you are. 
Before any of you leave, I gotta say this just for a minute. This can't, this can't bypass us to get this in our spirit. That do you know that me, Amy Kathleen Hayes Dockery, who was anointed and put in place last Sunday as the lead pastor of this beautiful community, is standing before you Sunday speaking with a stage four cancer diagnosis. That cannot pass us by. That was not in the cards according to the doctors, but God, but God. And all we have to do is say, God, I trust you. There's an assignment on my life and I am not going to take it for granted for one more day. Healing and restoration is coming right now. I need our, our pastors and prayer partners to please come down here. There's a lot of tears right down here. I want you to agree, touch every person. And right now we are gonna pray the prayer of healing right now. The Bible says that healing is the children's bread. And I told you it wasn't the main mission. Jesus didn't come just to heal the sick, but he said, those miracle signs and wonders are gonna follow all those who believe. That was the lowest thing he did. The smallest thing he did was heal. He's here to heal. He's not just able, he's willing. He's willing to heal. And right now, every hand raised right here, any healing you need, addiction in Jesus' name is broken. The power of addiction right now is broken. In Jesus' name, Holy Spirit right now, breaker of chains, we thank you that the same Spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead lives in us. And right now, we declare that that Spirit is touching, healing, aligning right now in Jesus' name. We uproot every lie that has been spoken over every life in this altar right now. Every lie that said you won't amount to anything. Every lie that said that you'll never make it. Every lie that said you can't do it on your own. Every lie that said you're not gonna live, you're gonna die. Every lie that said you're not smart enough to understand this. Every lie is broken in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you right now that the voice of many waters is lifting up a standard against every lie of the enemy. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, have your way. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Is it okay for us to have church here for just a minute? We thank you, Father, for deliverance right now in Jesus' name. God, we thank you that in a minute you can do what no man can do. We release it right now in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father, for right desires. God, I thank you that you're taking away the desire for things that destroy in Jesus' name. We thank you, God, that you're releasing. You're mending the broken heart right now. You're mending the broken heart. What God wants to release in this house and in this world, but it's gonna start in the church. God wants to release in this house a craving, a craving for the presence of God where His word is held high. And when His, His will and His way are seen, His word is honored, He's there to heal, to restore. Right now, we come into agreement. I thank you, church, for, for just raising your hands for everyone that's in the altar right now. We come into agreement. There's big prayer requests up here. There's healing of cancer that we're gonna see happen right now. We thank you for it, Jesus. We don't have to strive for it. We don't have to say all the perfect words. All we have to do is just trust you and believe that you're a good God. And we know that that goodness, that greatness that gave his life on a cross for us was so that we could live an abundant life, not a life of struggle. It doesn't mean that everything will be easy because when you have an enemy, he's still gonna come after you. 
But what it means is you don't have to fight by yourself. Jesus is in your corner. Jesus has your back. You are not alone. He's with you right now. He is with you right now. He's with you right now. He's with you right now. God, we just thank you for supernatural healing that's flooding this altar right now. We thank you, we trust you for it, God. This is your house, it's not ours. The schedule is not ours, it's yours. We thank you for healing, we thank you for healing, we thank you for healing in Jesus' name. LaKendra, we're asking God to restore your sight in the name of Jesus. We're asking, Father, right now for healing touch, Lord, that opens her eyes. We're asking for a creative miracle right now in Jesus' name. We thank you for this faithful child. And God, we just ask that this testimony will circle the earth in the goodness of who you are. We ask, Father, right now that you raise her up as a mighty vessel, declaring the works of the Lord. We say that this is the Lord's doing and it's marvelous in our eyes. Amen. 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 We're not going to rush anybody, but I will take the time to dismiss you. And we're going to ask the worship team to continue to worship for a few minutes here. But I'll bless all of you who are ready to go. We'll see you next week. We have a great word on partnerships powerful partnerships that God wants to bring into your circle. And I know that this word has come to you in this season because God is, is weary with you being broken. He wants to see you move to the next level. He wants to see your life restored. He wants to see you ruling and reigning with Christ Jesus. And you've got to get a, a picture of what God sees for your heart and for your life. And when I say this blessing over you, I want you to know that the part that says, may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you. Did you know that what that means is, may he smile at you. Lifting your countenance, that's what it means. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord lift his countenance. May he smile upon you and give you peace. And may he cover you with his name. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Love you. See you next week.